All right. Hey, everybody. This is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books. I'm so thrilled to welcome you to our ongoing virtual author series, which we've been doing since the beginning of this COVID-19 era that we're living through right now. So in uh, April, we began doing about two, sometimes three author events a week to give you something to look forward to, to put on your calendar, uh, to have a date of some kind in mind that's cultural and something to look forward to. So we're thrilled that you're joining us for these and hope you will do so in the future. We probably will not be returning to in-person events, I would say probably until 2021, which is a bummer, but uh, we're going to be having a lot of special programming between now and then. Um, I don't want to give you the whole list because it's a lot, so I would encourage you to go to our website, magiccitybooks.com. You can see the full list of what's coming up. I will say one thing in particular. On September 8th, we will be doing an event with Margaret Atwood, and we're going to be really looking forward to that, um, talking about her sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, The Testaments, and much, much more. So the tickets are on sale for that right now. They're going pretty quick. So, um, And she's been kind enough, actually, to uh, sign books for us. So we have up to 500 actual signed books for that, as opposed to book plates, which we've been doing a lot lately. But you'll get a real, actual signed book from Margaret Atwood, and I hope you will join us for that. I'm not nervous at all about interviewing her. It should be uh, very very fun. I'm excited about it. Um, but I, um, tonight is going to be a really, really special night. We've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of great people over these last few months. Um, but this one is something that's really special, especially for us here in Oklahoma. Um, we are, the book has just come out, I believe yesterday was the official um, uh, launch date for this Truly, you know, we talk about um, a labor of love. When you see this new collection, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, this Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry. Um, these things take a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of organization. And we will be talking with three people who spent a lot of time and effort and passion doing this. So tonight we will be joined by the U.S. Poet Laureate and our good friend Joy Harjo, who we've had so many great events with over the last uh, couple of years. We got to launch the most recent poetry book and just about a year ago exactly, we did a fun event at the store for a, another wonderful anthology called The Eloquent Poem, uh, which came out about a year or so ago. So Joy will be joining us. Uh, we have Leanne Howe, who I, I don't think we've ever done an event with through Magic City Books, but I will just say personally, I've been a fan of from afar for a long time. So it's a, an honor to have you joining us for this event. And we also have Jennifer Forrester and together, along with some other help, and you'll hear some how this book came together, edited and, and really put this project together. And it really is quite a feat. Um, but tonight I will not be handling the moderating duties. I am going to be passing that off to my dear friend, Christina Burke, who is the curator of Native American art at Philbrook Museum of Art, which I should candidly say is where I work by day and have been for the past decade plus. Um, Christina is a true expert in the field that she, that she works in and is also just one of my favorite people around. And um, Christina has known uh, Joy for quite a bit of time. And actually there's one fun connection coming up too. Um, at Philbrook on October 7th, we're gonna be opening a special exhibition called Hearts of Our People, Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists, which was originated by the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and is on its way to us or has maybe already started coming to us uh, most recently from the Smithsonian. Um, the show is, set to open this summer and of course the world changed and some of those dates got pushed back but this show is going to be such an amazing experience it opens it's it's um covers a wide range of time it's got everything from you know things you think you might see in a show of native women artists but also everything from a El Camino fashioned after Maria Martinez's beautiful black on black pottery and all kinds of stuff in between. So I would encourage you to go to philbrook.org, check that out and get ready for hearts of our people. So I'm going to turn it over to Christina to handle our moderating duties. But before I do that, finally, I will say this. If you have questions this evening, please put those into the 
Q&A. We will be incorporating those questions as we go. So uh, feel free to ask anything that pops into your mind. And more importantly, in the chat function here, we will be sharing uh, links to buy the book because you definitely need a copy of this book. This is one of those things that you'll be dipping back into for years and years. It's like those, it's like the joy of cooking. You know, it's like something that you'll have on your shelf and you'll want to go back to all the time, give it to somebody years from now and really become part of your, your permanent library. So I want to say thank you to Joy and Leanne and Jennifer for joining us. And I will hand it off to Christina to take, take the evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, I'm Christina Burke, curator of Native American art at Philbrook Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is within the boundaries of Muskogee Creek Nation, as is Magic City Books. Just want to start off by, by situ situating us in place. Um, and again, joining me is Jennifer Forrester, Leanne Howe, and Joy Harjo. Um, and actually, before we begin, I wanted to um, I got my, my own copy from Magic City Books. I'm thrilled to have it. Um, and in Joy's introduction, I think the first few sentences are a great way for us to start out. So in her introduction, she writes, we begin with the land. We emerge from the earth of our mother and our bodies will be returned to earth. We are the land. We cannot own it, no matter any proclamation by paper state. We are literally the land, a planet. Our spirits inhabit this place. And I think these words are a great place to start, again, to situate us all, um, but also in, in thinking about and looking at how the book is organized, which again is by land and place. Maybe that is somewhere we can start our discussion in terms of the organization of, um, of all of these wonderful poems that you all have put together. Okay, <laughs> I guess I will start because I uh, uh, I went to Norton. I really wanted to do excuse me. I really wanted to do a um, actually a uh, a Norton anthology of Native literature, you know, to cover everything. But uh, we were told they wanted a book of poetry. They wanted uh, they had really, you know, they studied their market and they wanted a book of Native poetry. And that's fine. No one has ever really done a comprehensive book. Norton, Norton anthologies are kind of the quintessential anthologies. And to have a Norton anthology really means a lot to uh, Native people because um, there, there hasn't been one. There's Norton anthologies for everybody so far but us. So as we started putting it together, we thought about, well, how do, you know, how do we organize it? We could or organize it chronologically with tribal group or so on and, and decided to do it by geographical area area and again that has its flaws too no there's no perfect way but th that's to underline that we are you know we're part of these the, the geographical area has so much to do with our expression the way we use language even and the way we even construct poems and that started really i we started really noticing that after we got this, you know, went, have gone through, you know, all of this compiling and editing and um, that you could tell the difference, certainly by the, the, the story of colonization in particular parts of the country uh, with uh, themes and um, the way language is used and, and, and so on. It really, it really makes a difference. We also started with, because the three of us well, there's the three of us as the, the um, leading the team of editors, but we also had many contributing editors, all native, all native poets, regional advisors, all native poets, uh, managing editors. Um, at that time, well, Leanne still has a position at University of Georgia and I left mine, but we had two really wonderful uh, grad students who worked with us who are non-native and then we had um, I went to my department and asked if I could teach a class on how to put together a Norton anthology of native poetry. So I was able to do, so then we had our workers, you know, and, and they also learned about native poetry. And so that's how it put, it's put together. But the three of us are, uh, are Southeastern natives. You know, Leanne is uh, Choctaw and Jennifer and I are in Muscogee Creek. Jennifer's of the Perryman family. And um, we decided that we would be 
we would because we would keep the southeast section last <laughs> to be to be polite and start in the direction that are that you know encountered clockwise with our directions because that's how that's how uh, it goes in our in our in our culture. So um, it goes counterclockwise from northeast, uh, midwest to northwest, Alaska, Hawaii, huge territory. I mean, we only had, we were given at first only 300 pages. I mean, how are you going to deal with 567 tribal groups, um, all the poets and the different languages and, and history? And, you know, it's, that was the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. is to have so so there's a lot of people who think this could be three four or five times as large as it was right and we also so that's how we organized it geographically all the way around to the southeast and uh, and then we went from the oldest some of the oldest poems to the most to the youngest so that that's how we arranged it i don't know if you guys want to add anything I'll just say, I'll say that this organization, once that uh, we had focused on the land, it really developed itself. I just want to say that that's the spirit of this book that, um, as Joyce said, it moved around counterclockwise. We all come from tribes that dance counter sun, counterclockwise. And once that was like a matrix, it felt that way to me that it began to fall into place what that structure would look like. And it felt very, um, uh, it felt very spiritual, very, um, we knew and felt like that our communities, both in the past, present and future are, were with us. And uh, the, I think the structure was the key. Honestly, Joy, I, I do. Once we got that, it just, it worked, it worked. So it was a lot, a lot of love. And I think we got so much help, mm -hmm. I did. you know, so much help, yeah. Yeah, one thing about the, the team, it was such a strong team with the contributing editors. We had 15 contributing editors, all native poets. Um, and what worked so well about the structure of regions um, is that we divided the poets into regions from where they were from. So the contributing editors from the West um, were in the Southwest West region um, and that kind of thing. So really each region had several people that were responsible for, for that region. They were like the caretakers of that place, you know, choosing, really um, leading the way and choosing the poets, um, choosing the poems. You know, we, I mean, we, it was, so difficult to choose poems for this, of course. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of really good poems. So we'd have Google spreadsheets that we'd be sharing and everyone would comment and then we'd have to rank, like choose them and say, well, how many people choose this one and this one? And so really the whole team, everyone was involved in selection, but the regional editors were kind of leading their area and were responsible for saying, oh yeah, but what about so-and-so? We, we didn't look at them yet. So it was a really collective effort. Mm -hmm. I think so. It strikes me too that all of you have commented not just on place, but on movement across place and thinking about that dynamic, not static, but dynamic movement um, and the association with dance, but also with song and, and how poetry and song are, um, are e e expressions um, that move as well in various ways. I like that you say it like that because so often in, you know, we're frozen, we are not allowed to move in the American imagination. We're often just kept within a particular time or, or frame of reference, which usually winds up in some romantic or savage, <laughs> savage <laughs> view or, 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 you know, NFL or whatever, but rather than, you know, here, than as living peoples who had dynamic you know, economies right. you know, and, and poetry can be part of economy. I won't go into that, but you know, the, it's a kind of a trade thing, you know, where you're moving, you know, and that's how we live. We move. A lot of people think, oh, you know, they want to keep us in one place, but 
we always moved. We had a car, we're going to go as far as the car will take us. If we have a plane, we'll go in a plane. If we have a canoe, you know, we'll, we'll be up because we, all of us, we like to visit, share. I mean, we're human beings. And I remember just starting out as a poet and as a kid, you know, practically at the University of New Mexico. And, and I started writing out of native rights movements. And I thought, if I do anything else with my work, and, and this anthology is part of our work, our work, is I want us people to see us as human beings. We can be poets. We can, um, we can be, you know, we were we're human beings and people all, uh, that static stereotype has really um harmed a lot of our people and one of the things that we wanted to do was be mindful that this is not um a text about um those kinds of stereotypes and so um I think we were mindful of a lot of things, um, and and so with the contributing editors, as Jennifer was saying, they were so good and so strong in putting their sections together. It was pretty amazing to watch. Um, I, I, I will, yeah, I would just say one other thing. We we moved as we were working on this book. So at one point, Joy had suggested we, we go to Santa Fe. And so we went to Santa Fe and uh, worked on the book. We worked in Atlanta. Um, you know, we were moving as we were working. And so I think that had a lot to do with uh, the generosity of the land that we were pulled together around. Mm -hmm. that's great and and who isn't productive in santa fe right such a <laughs> such a beautiful place and great food and that was awesome. <laughs> well you've all talked also about this team approach and this collaboration and my goodness the number of contributors um how you talked a little bit about the uh sort of the mechanics of it, but as you did research and as people um, found possible in inclusions, were there any surprises? Anything that uh, uh, works you hadn't read before, voices you hadn't heard before that really were new to you that just said, we've got to include this? There were definitely surprises in the poems. You know, I, yeah. I, I might, might have read, you know, several of one poet's poems, but then someone would say, oh, there's this one. They dig it up out of a book and it just, you know, blew me away. So I really, I really learned so much. I, you know, I got to read so widely. We have such a, we have such a range of poets. Mm -hmm. So there were some, some unexpected things, even if you were familiar with the poet's voice, but that particular work of theirs. Yeah, really just to see how, I mean, not only are we all diverse as poets, but our poetries are diverse. And also our, our stream of poetics is diverse. So someone's earlier poem is very different perhaps from a later poem. Um, and you know, sometimes then the question would be, should we include the most recent work of this poet or should we include, include an earlier work that had maybe a larger audience at the time or it's been more anthologized or it's more known? Those are really difficult choices. Mm -hmm. I would, I would also add, um, I, I don't, I don't know how do you think, uh, how you feel about this, Jennifer and Joy. Um, I, for instance, to me, the, the eloquent poem that um, Elazar wrote, El, uh, 16, 1687, is that right? 1687, he's in the early section in the Northeast, uh, was, it was an elegy and it was so, it, to me, I had not, I didn't know this work. 1678, that's, the, that's yeah. the work. And I, for me, that was eye opening to read this, this, this person's work uh, from so long ago and yet the beauty, and it was, and he wrote it in Latin first. I mean, mm. that, that amazes me to this day. 
It is amazing. It also makes me sad because Cotton Mather, you know, appeared to published it. And, and, you know, what place did he have as a young native? He was, uh, yeah, he was considered a, a demon or a monster. And I wonder how Cotton Mather, <laughs> you know, you know they, they civilized him that we don't know. We know his, all we know of him is his name is Eliezer. Um, and he, um, he wrote this beautiful elegy in a certain, um, there's a word for it. It's a certain kind of sermon, a very particular kind of sermonizing. And uh, he was the first, probably the first native published, you know, with a published uh, piece in this country. I think about him, they, they, he died very, very young. They don't really know what tribe. He was definitely native. And uh, so, but here, you know, here he is. Are there things about working on, on this particular project that you think have or will affect your own work and your own process, creative process? Hmm. Well, I certainly read a lot for this book. <laughs> uh, and I think that always shifts, you know, we learn from what we, we learn, we just absorb and learn. And um, so I think so, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to tell, but I got to read so many wonderful poets. Yeah, and there's so much that isn't in here. Yeah. We had to go with, we decided to go with the arts and crafts, really the arts and crafts board of, you know, the, you know, because the question always comes up, who is native? And uh, we went with people who were enrolled, you know, enrolled and federally recognized and a few uh, legitimate state recognized tribes. But I guess what I, I came away with it too, thinking about, I can think about, I mean, we did so much reading. I think about all the poems that aren't in here that are also worthy of being in here. And I think about these and I'm still kind of, it takes me a while. It takes, I, I, it takes me a while to process something. And I feel like I'm still processing the anthology. I'm still processing what this is and all of, you know, the poems in it. So how it directly affects is that I think I'm very humbled by, I'm humbled at giving the, being able to have the opportunity to, to, to help take care, to help take care of these poem, these poems, you know, of um, all these voices, so many of them are are gone you know are gone but we have their descendants they inspire they're inspiring across time even the younger ones coming up it's quite um i'm still thinking about it i still haven't really processed the whole all of it i don't know how it directly affects what i'm doing except that um as artists there's i think of a process where we we're in this moment where we collect, we, we, we hone our craft and we're collecting ideas and we have dreams and, and images and so on. And then the next part is putting it all together. And then the third part is releasing it and sharing it. And, and that's, that's the moment we're in now. Yeah. And this is the sharing. We all have to do that, whatever we're doing. And this is part of the sharing. But they're giving back to me more so than anything I've done, I think, you know, with all of us, I think we'd all probably say that, that, that despite all the work that the whole team put together is we've gotten, you know, it's, it inspires, I guess what I would say directly, you know, after going the long way around, which is why I write things down <laughs> instead of speaking them, you know, is that I wind up being, you know, I'm inspired, this work inspires me and, and it lets me know that no matter pandemic, no matter crazy political mayhem um, that we are the earth and that we will, I read these poems and I think, yes, we, you know, we're still here. We're still connected. We, uh, we may, some of the poems are in our tribal languages, some are in English, but the spirit of who we are is very alive and it will outlast any of this other craziness. It sounds like you, you all also feel a sense of responsibility to the poets themselves, but also to um, to the audience and and how you're presenting these to others, how you're sharing. Mm. Yeah, my I, I I think there is that um, because 
we in our literatures have, and I say that plural, because the literatures of people of Native nations are very, very are varied. Our literatures have so often just, you know, people want to say, oh, this is it. Oh, I get it. I'm going to take a course in Native literature and say this is what it is. And so there seems, you know, there's always this pull to identify, define, and create a boundary around and say, okay, this is that. And so in, the danger in creating an anthology is that it presents itself as representative. You know, these are the poets. But this is not, you know, this anthology is a doorway to into so many other poets, um, so many of us that aren't able to, weren't able to be included or whose poems are so vastly different from the ones in the anthology because they're still writing and experimenting. So really this anthology is a doorway. So I think for me, the sense of responsibility is more the, how do we, how do we tell people, please just begin here and keep going rather than don't make this the last thing, the first and last thing you ever read of poets by people of Native nations. And you're not gonna be able to walk away from the book and say, oh, okay, I get, I get what Native poetry is now. Um, quite the opposite. So that's, that's the hope. Yeah, I guess we kind of work anti-academically that way. We're not saying this is the quintessential or this is the uh, authority. That's not it. Mm -hmm. This is, I like what you said, Jennifer, it's a doorway. Me too, me too, it's a doorway into other uh, other work and continuing to uh, read the next generation and the next generation and seven generations forward. Um, this is an exciting time. I think this is an explosive time for Native poetry, Native literature, Native film. All of these things are happening and churning up together and I, I'm really humbled by what came before and humbled by the, the future. These the new poets, these younger poets are just amazing to me. And some of them are in the book. I mean, it's, it's um, we, we wanted that generational family mm -hmm. of poets to come together and, and we did the very best we could to honor that, mm -hmm. honor the, that space of the past, present, and then the future. Mm -hmm. And again, in your comments, to me, there's this sense of, of movement, of dynamism, reaching back, but moving forward. Um, it's ongoing. It's continual. Mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful and an and important big lesson. Mm -hmm. I think I was just going to say one more thing about the about the process. I think at, at uh, Joy, Jennifer, and and, and I uh, would would meet together, and I always felt like that we had you know as a writer you feel like there are a lot of people in the room writing with you a story and so forth, but I always felt like when we were doing the work that there were a lot of people standing around us and um, um, they, were, they were just in the room. I don't know how you guys felt. Um, maybe that's how I, uh, that's how I often would feel. Mm -hmm. We did a few sessions where the three of us, well, we, it took us several sessions, but we read through the entire thing together um, out loud. It took more than <laughs> there were long sessions. A lot of long sessions, <laughs> hours and hours, but it was really important. Art. It, yeah. All art, I mean, all literature is has an or a base in orality, <laughs> even if it's in a book. Yeah. So we read everything aloud to see how it worked. Yeah. yeah. And I remember how intense those readings were because you're you're spanning generations and so many different voices and really hearing in each other's voice the layers and layers of messages that are coming through the poem, um, the pain, the joy, the humor, all of these intense emotions. And so we would just be saturated with, with so many experiences and reading it all the way through. Yeah, and tears at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're reading through tears. Yeah. That sounds like a really incredible process also to have that performative aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So 
not just reading to oneself, but to each other. And again, that, that dynamic of really listening to somebody's words as spoken by another person in the room. Mm -hmm. And it's important, you know, I, people talk, I think telling each of the children or each other stories, however, you, whether it's reading or, but there's something about the orality. My, my neighbors over here, Matt and Melinda Galindo are, you know, they have a little boy, he's probably only getting nearing two and they, they've been reading from here. This is the reading, the reading at night before going to sleep. Is a reading poetry to him from here. Oh. <laughs> I and I, I like that. Is reading I always, you know, storytelling of some sort. <laughs> We've got a, a couple of questions from audience members. Um, so one is um, about the number of poets who are in the anthology, and I don't know if anyone knows off the top of their heads how many. One hundred and sixty, is it? 161. 161, okay. 161, well, there we go. <laughs> That's a lot. 90 nations. 90 nations, okay. Yeah. That's, that's an incredible diversity. And then, again, thinking about um, what maybe didn't make it into, into this particular publication, but um, might be available in other places. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question about inspiration and motivation, and particularly how you all might work through writer's blocks. Um, so when you're, when you're having that moment where the creativity isn't coming to you, what are your strategies for working through those blocks? Sometimes they're not meant to, sometimes they're there because you need to stop and yeah. mm -hmm. jump over it, go around it, or there's something you need before you can go, before you can go ahead. I mean, sometimes you just need a break. Sometimes there's something else that you need, another piece of information. Sometimes you need to start over. I remember working on a poem all summer and I had a whole notebook and I finally just threw it out because it wasn't working. It was about gravity. <laughs> it was about the whole poem was about gravity and so on. And I realized that it wasn't anchored. <laughs> and yeah. I, I let it go. It was my big project all summer. And you just have to be, oh, you have to be fluid and I'd like to say I don't have my, many, many times of writer's block because I'm terrified that I won't get something done. And so um, I, I just stop with the project. And like Joy said, this, I work very similar. I go on to something else. But I'm always, um, um, I was an, a newspaper journalist, so I worked on deadline every, every day for a long time. And I was always terrified that 11 o'clock would come and I didn't have the draft done. So I brought that same <laughs> energy um, into creative work. And so, um, you know, there's a reason I'm hobbled and, you know. <laughs> I like to look at other art. Um, and I like to turn it into an exercise. So for example, if I'm stuck, I'll go to a gallery um, and I'll make an exercise for myself, like go to 10 paintings or 10 photographs and um, write notes about what you see. And sometimes I'll be more specific, like um, what's not in the picture. So I just, I engage with something that's not text. Um, and the, the exercises really help me because what it does is it gets me out of the about part. Like, oh, I really want to write about, yeah, like gravity. Um, and I get so stuck in the idea of the about that I, I, I lose, I think I lose sight. Um, so regaining sight by looking at other kinds of arts, you know, they open up different parts of our scene. So I, I've always found that helpful. And the exercise part is just maybe because I'm really organized. And so if I apply an organizational mechanism to my scene, then I have to fulfill the task. Like I have to write 15 words for each picture or something like that. And now, you know, not being able to go to galleries or museums, you know, sometimes I'll watch a movie and I'll decide every five minutes, I'm going to stop the movie and just look at that clip and try to write what I see mm. in terms of the light angles or something, you know, I mean, we're surrounded by art. It doesn't have to be a gallery at all, you know, 
the weavings on Joy's wall and, you know, and Leanne's wall and the flamingo. So. <laughs> That's great, Jennifer. You gave concrete examples. Yes. <laughs> People need. Well, I need them a lot lately, so I'm trying to make up more exercises for myself to get myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it, I'm writing I'm, that down. <laughs> no, those are I'm, good. I'm taking notes too for various things. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the other questions, and and uh, I think to something that you mentioned, Jennifer, about this challenging time now um, uh, in in the period of COVID and lockdowns and things closed and whatnot. And there's a question about historical trauma and reconciling historical trauma that might be in some of these poems and stories um, and relevance to today and dealing with this trauma that we're in now. The whole country's in historical trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Really, I was, I had to write this speech for this thing I was for Saturday and I was thinking about how at Indian school, before we even knew there was such a word, we embodied it. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, yes, of course, that's what we were saying. We were, you know, going through this. I mean, it, a poem holds, can hold history, can hold different, even oppositional threads of history within the same place, which is makes it can be so very powerful. And so poems can hold that in a way that maybe we cannot to hold it in our to hold it in our bodies might kill us. But mm -hmm. if you hold it in a poem or you put it in a piece of art, you find a way to take something that is destructive and even meant to destroy you like massacres and long walks and all of that to you take it and turn it into um, a material. You, 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 and so, and you see that in the poems. These are people, these voices coming up, you know, through ancestral voices and, and voices up, you know, in our cities and so on saying, well, you know, in, in very individual and sometimes hilarious and crazy and, and incredibly beautiful ways that, hey, wait, we're here. I am here. When you get a voice in a poem, it's, you know, I am here. We are here. It's almost yeah. like an echo that goes through the whole through the whole, through all of, through all of Indian country. Right. Well, and, and speaking of voices and this um, part of the process where you all read to each other, so somebody also asked if, um, if you know if this might be an audio book at some point and to have various voices reading these poems as part of what's put out to the public. I wondered about that because I did audio books, you know, for the last, I've been doing audio books, but I thought, oh my God, to do this, it would be quite an endeavor. <laughs> to, certainly to, to do all these voices. And right now the book is over 400 pages long. I don't know. No one has offered to, to put <laughs> into an audio book, but um, it would be kind of, yeah, a Norton anthology into an audio book, but that's wonderful. Yeah, I think that's a great that's idea. A idea. I will ask my agent about that. <laughs> <laughs> but then to get all the voices, that would be the that yeah. would be the hard thing is to try to pull all the voices, but it wouldn't be impossible. Mm. No. So we have a, a, a question from um, an indigenous high school English teacher who was wondering if there's a particular poem that would be good for high school juniors and seniors some of whom are indigenous during this time. Do you all have any recommendations for this educator? I think all would be, I mean, I know that's not specific or helpful at all, but. Um, There's a lot to choose from. Well, yeah, and um, you know, and thank you to Jenny, who is an educator during this time, especially high school. So thank you for the work you do and for bringing poetry into the classroom. Um, mm -hmm. I did some writers in the schools for a while and with high school and elementary school. And I realized I could almost bring in any poem and, and it's someone who's gonna find an access point for, for them. Um, so that's not a very helpful answer, but, um, and oh, another thing I did wanna mention is that, you know, we have a lot of wonderful predecessors of anthology makers, mm -hmm. one being Hyde Erdrich, who is in this anthology. And she, we, she was four years ago, came out with um, an anthology of native poets whose first book 
came out in the first decade. I think that was the premise of this mm -hmm. century. So there's a lot of younger poets in that book, as well as in this one. So, you know, that might be another resource to look into for the high school students. But maybe I will read this one to read something. I think there was a request to read yeah. uh, from a high school student, another high school student years ago in 18, um, I think he wrote this in 18, um, uh, oh, yeah, written in 1913 at Carlisle Indian School. And so this was a kid, I can imagine the, you know, he wrote it, I guess, for the school paper, but maybe he was given an assignment and he said, oh no, poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then he wrote this poem that is, um, I, I love this poem. And we don't know his name. It's called Anonymous Poet from Room 8. And if you don't know, Carlisle Indian Industrial School was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and it was founded by that person, Pratt, who in 1879 started the school as a tool to, um, to uh, kill the Indian and save the man. Mm. And yet here, the voice of this young high school student who was in this school that, you know, militarized education, you know, because in the poem, he's going out, he's being marching, you know, the students marching, and they shaved their hair and, and made them wear uniforms. And, um, but here he is, the spirit of this, this young man comes through. It's in, uh, so I'll read this. This was written in 1913. And I think even if you're a high school student now that you can still hear yourself in here about not wanting to get up and then you gotta go to that classroom and, and you know, but then you're thinking about what you're gonna eat, <laughs> you know? And so it's called My Industrial Work. Also, the, uh, the, um, a lot of these students were trained, like I have an aunt who was at Carlisle and have some of her reports from a letter that she wrote to Carlisle after she went home. And, but, you know, at one point she was working cleaning for people in town. That's what they, you know, their education, right. they taught to clean in town. So he's uh, my industrial work. At half past two in the afternoon, you can find me in 28 room about three or four covers deep. You turn them back, you'll find me asleep. And there I lie and patiently wait for the final exams we have in room eight. When the whistle blows at half past five, once more I am up and still alive. Then I run down and wash my face and comb my hair and I'm ready for grace. In 15 minutes, there's a bugle call. The troops fall in and the roll is called. Then out in front, the troops all stand saluting the flag with our hats in our hands. While standing in the wind, our hair gets wavy, but just the same, we right face and march to gravy. Now this may sound like going a fishing, but this is my only industrial position. Well, and that's, that's a great example of somebody else was asking um, if uh, did the personal biography or history of, of the poets sometimes present circumstances uh, that influenced your choosing of their work? Hmm. The poems had to be good poems. Mm -hmm. But we did try to have, you know, I, I know I'm still thinking about this too. We tried to, you know, have, get a balance at the same time, but I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. it felt like it was really, I mean, when we began, you know, we all just said, you know, threw out names, you know, we all had so many names of poets that we, whom we loved. Um, mm -hmm. We had no shortage of poets and, you know, tried to include as many as we could. And then the choice of the poems was really, um, you know, kind of a collective thing. And, but we did try to bring, you know, we wanted to have some humor and, you know, a lot of different ranges of emotion in the anthology too. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the other questions is about, uh, uh, was it a challenge finding indigenous women poets from earlier historical periods? And thinking about, no, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I'm, I'm laughing because I think that the, the early poems are from women, are, are 
written by women. And so their voices were, you know, we, uh, for, as I'll just speak for myself, you know, I had to keep saying, yeah, we, we need some men too. And, um, you know, later, later or more in more contemporary times, there's a lot of native men writers, but in the beginning, these are native, look, look at Jane Schoolcraft. Mm -hmm. um, and she was writing in two languages um, French and English, and then she also wrote in um, Ojibwe. So, I mean, that's an amazing, um, I think there was, we managed the balance pretty well, but I just want to say, yeah, it was definitely uh, women. I don't know, how do you guys feel about it? Joy? There has been a lot of good scholarship, you know, there has been scholarship on early Native writers. I think by scholars and native scholars who were saying, you know, we have been writing a long time, by the way. So, you know, there were some wonderful, I'm going to list them in the introduction, you know, which <clears throat> kind of worked from, and particularly for native women writers. Um, so that was wonderful to see. And gosh, there are so many more, I'm sure. So here's another question about sort of the, the her process of, um, of creating this publication. Um, although curating can certainly be a dirty word in Native studies, as museums have traditionally focused on static representations rather than dynamic, living and vibrant representations of Natives. This semester in particular, I've been thinking about teaching as curation. And it has helped me to work through not being able to be in class with students. I wonder how the gathering and curating process differs from your own writing process. Hmm. That's a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I like, I like the idea of teaching as curation of an experience or you know, presenting material, moving it around. I, I think for my own writing process, um, I, I think there is quite a lot of, there's a lot of gathering um, mm -hmm. for sure. And much, much, most of it is kind of gathering words and materials, things that I wouldn't often think about should belong in a poem. So I try to gather things in my notebook mm -hmm. uh, in hopes that they'll later surprise me and find their way into a poem. So gathering is a really big part of the process. And so it was similar, you know, doing this anthology was so much fun as much fun as it is to gather material for a poem. So there was a lot of, I think, some similar experience there. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't thought about curation in terms of my own work, though. Yeah. Yeah. The book is a kind of container. Mm -hmm. Call it a basket or, um, you know, a pottery or it's a container. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Full of ideas and voices and periods of time, eras, um, yeah. Yeah, that was a good question. Yeah. Um, and as a curator, one of the things that, that I think is so important is those relationships between things, whether they're objects, whether they're materials, it's, there's, um, everything has its own nature in and of itself, mm -hmm. but then there's that relationship, right? The dynamic, between and among things. And mm -hmm. that's where some of the magic can happen. Right. Yeah, it was and interesting just, when we read through all the poems together, there were so many moments where we placed them chronologically. So based on birth date, um, just so to avoid, you know, that was easier to, that's just how we're going to do it. And there were many moments when the poems next to each other, like beautifully, you know, synchronistic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we didn't force that. It was, we wanted it to be kind of a, a great, you know, uh, diversity, you know, but, but it happened. Those magic moments certainly happened. Mm -hmm. And the way that themes thread through books. I mean, I think for my own work, I often think about that in curating, putting the poems together, how certain things resonate with others. And in this, it's, you know, all the work is different. There are no, you know, themes that everyone is writing about, you know, I mean, there's just so much diversity in this book, of course, because it's 161 poets. So you have 161 times everyone's 10 different various styles sometimes, but reading it through, 
you can find these kind of threads of resonance that they're speaking to each other, I think. And so some of those themes come out of the poems. There wasn't, there weren't themes that you all necessarily brought to the project, but things might have emerged out of the individual works. Right, we didn't say we were going to make it thematic in, in certain yeah. ways. It's it, the themes emerged naturally because the book was really it was really about a collecting historical you know making a collection that embodied native poetry throughout time. So the themes kind of emerged, you know, um, yeah, they emerged naturally. Mm -hmm. And I started to notice, but then I think if I say this, then I have to say exactly, but how you could see how colonization kind of moved in different parts yeah. of the country based on the land. Mm -hmm. And certain things would emerge or certain, and I need to be able to say exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, well, one thing in the Southeast, we noticed that we had fewer it seemed we had fewer poets or fewer poems mm -hmm. because of colonization. Because yeah, of in the Southeast, we've been writing for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so we were surprised by that. In fact, I think if we'd been publishing a prose, we would have quite a lot of Southeasterns <laughs> in the prose. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that's, uh, um, I don't have any scientific evidence, but I think the, the reason, and we were surprised that, you know, that our section was smaller, um, but I also think, well, goodness, um, in those early days that, that removal removed so much of your, uh, the poets that, that may have, were probably there, or, or they started out writing, uh, uh, prose, prose pieces. We have some excellent writers that also write prose, especially in the early years. You know, so I, I think that was there's a there's a there's a disjuncture or a tear that mm -hmm. happened, mm -hmm. and I that's how I, what I tell myself. Yeah. So that sometimes, if you look, if you think of the immense cultural. Um, entities that we, you know, that are our roots, that we are, that what we see here sometimes is shards, mm -hmm. that moments of something much larger. Yeah. Another thing to say about this is that, you know, we did, we talked about including poems that are primarily in the, in the oral, um, but ultimately we really, you know, we, these are texts that were written um, and that was part of the book. And a lot of that is, it may, you know, you, we can all speak to that, but so much of the oral traditions have been um, taken and published by non-native authors who are saying, oh, here's so-and-so, this chant and that chant, and they're translated. And it's like, who translated that? Um, so not only is it taken out of its culture, um, but it's translated out into a different context. And so, you know, we have these anthologies of native poetry that are kind of like, you know, chance, um, but there, there's, you know, there's so much, there's so much concern there, I think. Um, and we really, in respect of the work, you know, that was not something that we were going to do. Although we do have some, and it we was important, some. like the Kumulipo, mm -hmm. we have uh, some of a Hawaiian creation chant, you know, yeah, have she, effect, was, a small, a small excerpt, and we have moments of that, moments, yeah. but the you know the languages you know it's we have there's there are still major traditions in you know in the oral languages I know it's particularly in Navajo, for instance, mm -hmm. but then they belong in a certain place. A lot of these belong in a certain place, and if you take them out or if you move them into English, it shifts. You know, it shifts them. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, in in thinking about the arts writ large, the literary arts and visual arts, we have a question. Um, have any of you had your poems animated or interpreted as visual stories? Mm -hmm. um, if so, be interested in links or resources to those. Mm -hmm. 
Hyde Erdrich does, does that kind does of that. thing. She does a lot of that. So if you want to Google Hyde Erdrich and what does she call those? Uh, video poems, you, or just use that. Her, mm -hmm. her uh, animation work will pop up and they're, they're wonderful. Yeah. I think Trevino Brings Plenty also does. He does. He does mm -hmm. that kind of thing too. One of the poems in the book, uh, Noble Savage, Sees a, th a Therapy, I have a whole range of those, but one, one of those books, uh, one of those poems of Noble Savage has been turned into an animated po video poem. And Hyde was very helpful to me to get, get that done, so. Um, we've got another question about the linguistic variety in the poems um, that are part of the publication. Does its presence or absence speak about the heterogeneous um, or homogeneous? Um, sorry, I'm trying to read everything here. <laughs> uh, uh, identity politics in some way. So. Um, thinking about linguistic variety and, um, I guess, diversity of cultural identity as well. It seems that those probably go hand in hand. In other words, linguistic uh, uh, variation and, and diversity of cultural identity are both, are absolutely represented in this. Mm -hmm. I, w I mean, in terms of the linguistic variety, um, you know, the, we were very open to poems in various languages, of course. Um, and, um, and I think through that, yeah, I, I'm not answering the question very well, sorry. <laughs> well, it's a big question. And I think it, it, it's, it's hard to stand here and answer it right on the spot. I can, but I'm thinking about how, I think we have a poem here in Pidgin, in Hawaiian, in, mm. in Pidgin. We have a poem here by, it's one of my, it's, well, they're all my favorites, by Sherwin Bitsui, that tuo, 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 tuo. It's a word, Navajo word for water, and it's like a drip going down the page. We have the Kumulipo, uh, Hawaiian chan, and partly in Hawaiian, and then in, in translated into English. We have, um, you know, there's all kinds of ways that people assert, uh, are asserting linguistic diversity, even within, within or despite or without English. So there's yeah, and even variations. Like You're, or, or like Scott Momaday's The Delight Song of Sal Tay Lee. It's in English, but it's, it's also, you know, the English is the shadow part of the poem, so to speak. Yeah. 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 That's a great answer, Joy. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thanking my helpers here. <laughs> I was thinking, and sometimes it's hard to just think, you know, especially a question like that, too, because it encompasses so much, too. Yeah. And I think poetry itself, just the act of writing a poem in whatever language it is, is an assertion of one's cultural uniqueness, political uniqueness. And sometimes it's experiment with language. You know, I'm thinking of Orlando White's poems yeah. and how yeah. he, he will work with that language, that, you know, that language and make it what the poem wants it to be. And, you know, playing with syntax and, you know, creating unexpected varieties of lettering and that kind of thing. I mean, those are just how we engage with the word, the text itself is, is cultural freedom. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, um, there's a, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. I was just going to say quickly in the, um, I believe it's the Ojibwe section, the birds, the water birds will alight is a song, um, and it's it's also translated in um, Ojibwe uh, Moan. So. It's another example of a song, but also uh, it's translated in, in, in on the page. And so we, we included that. So it's, it's beautiful when it's, um, it's, it's beautiful. 
Yeah. And originally it also had images. I don't think we put, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, we didn't put the images in there. So no. they all work together as part of a text. Well, this has been really fantastic. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for, for joining us this evening. Um, and to, to wrap things up, can each of you go around and talk about what you're working on now that the anthology is out, sort of what's next and what we have to look forward to? I'm, I'm finishing uh, up or writing on 1918, and it's about my grandmother who had um, the, um, the 1918 flu, and uh, she lived in Stonewall, Oklahoma, so it's set uh, very close to where our home is. And um, uh, what happened to her as a result, her husband dies, et cetera, et cetera. So the, book, the new book is 1918. So wow. that's me, somebody else. Wonderful. I'm all open. I mean, honestly, I've, I, I finished a book that I have just been trying to let go. And um, I don't know, I'm really excited. It'll be something. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Um, yeah, you've got a, a dissertation too. I just read some of it that also should be a book too, Jennifer. Thank you. And then I'm working on <laughs> what's that? Go ahead. And then I'm working on a. I, I finished. Well, I have revisions to do on a memoir called "Poet Warrior: A Call for Love and Justice" that will be out next fall from Norton. Yeah. Music album. I just did the foundation tracks with Barrett Martin. Who was with Screaming Trees and played with all those uh, French <laughs> bands and is really he's been producing it and so that album right now it's called This Morning I Pray for My Enemies the album but I'm not sure what the final title will be but um, so that's another project and another anthology <laughs> you know yeah I said I will never do after this, this is a <laughs> lot of work. I will never you know watch that word for another <laughs> anthology but the Library of Congress project is a digital story map of native poets in the country. So um, mm -hmm. Norton asked, you know, wanted to see that. And so that's gonna be a smaller handbook size anthology called, I think it's Living Nations, uh, Living po Poetry. And that will be out in May from Norton, so. So lots to look forward to. Well, thank you all so much. Bado, Yakoke, thank you. We really appreciate you joining us this evening. And thanks to everybody out there on their laptops and desktops and phones. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And thanks, Jeff. Thanks for Jeff, Magic City Books. And yeah. Absolutely. Everybody take good care and stay safe. And we'll see you again soon. Okay. And thank you, Christina. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Anytime. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.